Anderson, and we are filling in for Dr. Deagle today on the new Traumatical Report on Friday, the 11th day of January, the 11th day of the year. Year LR 2013. Welcome to the Bill Deagle New Traumatical Hour. We're going to start out today talking about uh, firearms and firearms laws. Uh, there's been an interesting, very interesting bill proposed in the state of Wyoming legislature. Uh, it's uh, headlined on, it's not headlined on Drudge, but you can find it on Drudge Report. It's a uh, bill to help uh, protect the rights of firearms owners. It's uh, as these laws go, it's a fairly short uh, bill proposed, only three pages. And the first sentence really says it all. And, and here is the first sentence. An act relating to firearms, providing that any federal law which attempts to ban a semi-automatic firearm or to limit the size of a magazine of a firearm or other, other limitation on firearms in this state shall be unenforceable in Wyoming, providing a penalty and providing for an effective date. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I urge you to read this over yourself, maybe read it a couple of times. If you agree with what's in this uh, proposed legislation, uh, Wyoming House Bill at 0104, HB 0104, if you agree with what it says, I'm going to urge you to print out copies for your own state representatives, your state representatives and state senators, and urge them to introduce a similar bill, with obviously with the wording changed to reflect whatever state you might be in, urge them to uh, file a copy of it, get co-sponsors, file a copy of it, and uh, see if they can pass similar legislation in your state. That would be a very positive thing, a very helpful thing, to help us protect our Second Amendment rights. It's become very clear to me that the Republicrats, as they're sometimes called, because there is only one party, the way they act up there, they could care less about our Second Amendment or other parts of the Constitution. And so this would be a helpful thing to thwart the efforts at the federal level and uh, put some teeth behind it uh, at the state level. And I would urge people to follow up on that. I also urge people to consider joining the Gun Owners of America. Now, the National Rifle Association, I am a life member. I've not been real happy with the things they've been doing for quite a while. Uh, that, that aside, the National Rifle Association has been doing, as best I can tell, a very good job in this current crisis. They've been gaining about 8,000 new members a day, the National Rifle Association. Now, the Gun Owners of America have been the no-compromise gun rights organization for uh, quite a while. And when I say no compromise, the, uh, compared to the NRA, that's a good thing. I've personally seen the National Rifle Association continue to back uh, politicians who voted against the Second Amendment. In fact, one politician in, the, in particular, uh, Jim Talent, who was a U.S. congressman and, and later a U.S. senator, did in fact vote for in 1994, in September 1994, did in fact vote for the semi-automatic rifle ban, sometimes called the assault weapons ban, and the high magazine capacity um, ban, a high capacity magazine ban. He did in fact vote for that legislation, and the NRA continued to support him. You can't do that. You can't do that. Once a, a legislator has shown their true colors, and vote against the Constitution, there's no second chance. I know for a fact, because I, I know Jim Talent quite well, I, I helped him get elected in his first term as a U.S. congressman, I know that he was warned um, very directly and privately by a number of my friends not to vote for the uh, assault weapons ban and the high-capacity magazine ban, but he went ahead and did it anyway. So that's why I have very, I'm very cautious about what the NRA will do in this current crisis. So far, they're they're doing the right thing. They're standing up for our Second Amendment rights, and and that's a that's a good thing. Uh, so I think you should consider uh, possibly supporting the NRA as well as the Gun Owners of America. Uh, personally, I believe what's being looked looked for by the powers that be, people like Hussein Obama and Joe Biden, 
Personally, I believe what they are looking for is violent pushback against this legislation once it gets introduced into Congress or when it passes. Now, the, the pushback in 1994 didn't happen until after it passed. We're seeing everything in fast forward now. I recall like it was yesterday, 19 years ago, when the assault weapons ban and the high-capacity magazine ban was working its way through Congress through the spring and into the summer of 1994. Tens of thousands of men and women were watching it all over the country. The um, push to buy high-capacity magazines did not begin until the legislation was passed by Congress. That's when the uh, run on these various weapons and magazines began. Well, we're seeing the same thing happen now, except they're not waiting until it passes. It hasn't even been introduced. And you cannot buy from any, hardly, except for exorbitant prices, any 30-round 30, 30, uh, uh, magazines or AR-15 platform, uh, the AR platform rifles. They're all sold out. They've been sold out for weeks. And uh, there are some opportunists who are selling uh, high-capacity magazines at exorbitant prices. Same thing with the AR platform rifles. It's not a, it's not my favorite platform for a rifle, or the caliber or the platform itself, but uh, these uh, far, firearms are also being sold at exorbitant prices. Anyway, today it's going to be Ann Morrison and myself filling in for Dr. Bill, and this is the Nutrinet Medical Report. And if you uh, want the finest in nutraceutical products, I think you should visit uh, Dr. Deagle's website and uh, check it out. Uh, you, you'll be glad that you did. My website is thelibertyman.com, and Ann Morrison's website is homeland-defense-4-letter-u.com. We're coming up on a quarter after the hour here, and Ann, I know, has some interesting updates. There was some uh, activity in the sun today, wasn't there, Ann? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, John. Yes, there was. They had uh, NASA had predicted a 50% chance of an M-class flare, and I want to remind people that the designations go uh, B, C, M, X, and then the double X. And we had an M1.0 that was at nine o'clock this morning Central Time, so we weren't affected by it. And then we also had a uh, an M. 1.2, and that was at 2 o'clock, almost 3 o'clock in the morning. So the Central Standard Time, uh, luckily, was, did not get uh, direct contact with these. Of course, the sun is below the equator right now. Right. And, and so we wouldn't expect to, except that uh, we have seen activity in the northern hemisphere from the sun when the, when the um, flares have lasted a long time. Now, in this case, the M1 that occurred at 9 o'clock a.m. Central Time lasted for a minute 13 seconds. And uh, the other one lasted for a uh, minute 14 seconds. So those were not of long duration. But a minute, when you're talking about such a massive eruption, it is significant. And I wouldn't be surprised if there had been some, some burns. Uh, there, there was an X-ray event that occurred at the same time. So people who were flying over the Atlantic Ocean at that time uh, would have, may have experienced more x-rays through them than they would on an ordinary flight. They never mention the uh, sun when they talk about the average x-ray exposure that, you've got, that you get on a flight, but remember that they're at 30,000 feet. So that's six miles above the Earth and they are exposed to more x-rays than we are down here. We're more protected by the atmosphere. Right, right. So that was very interesting. Now, the other interesting thing is it has moved. This is up. Hold that thought. we got a break. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. There was something so pleasant about all right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. This is J.R. Moore and Ann Morrison uh, filling in for Dr. Deagle today. Dr. Deagle has the day off, and we're uh, filling in here on the Nutra Medical Report on Genesis Communications. Ann, why don't you continue where you left off before the break? Okay, I do want to um, just say briefly that this, they're calling it the evil twins, 
because the uh, AR-1654 is a big double sunspot. In other words, it's two sunspots. Both of them are four times the size of the Earth, and they are linked magnetically. So they're calling out the, uh, the evil twins. And it looks like it's moved closer to the center of the solar disk, and that would mean that probably within, uh, by Monday, the, any flares from that would be Earth-directed. And uh, not that this one wasn't. This was at East 39, which is uh, closer to the center of the sun than, than And just the for the benefit of those who don't, aren't aware, uh, uh, tell us the possible effects on uh, Earth and, and our activity on Earth from a solar flare hitting us. Oh, well, they could be many. Uh, anything above an M, actually anything above a C that has any duration, these only lasted a minute and 13 seconds, and that was a magnitude uh, 1.2 and a magnitude 1. But it was an X-ray event, and that means that it, that it uh, was accompanied by a, an extraordinary solar flare X-ray emission. And what that does is that means that people that are flying, for instance, would, uh, flying over the Atlantic this morning, uh, or even close to Europe, would have been uh, would have gotten a double dose or triple dose of X-ray during their flight, uh, just because this flare went off. Understood. What what effect would this possibly have on power grids, communications equipment, and? Yeah, they didn't say it was accompanied by a CME, but I'm suspicious that it were was. Uh, and if it is, they'll, they'll show a track of that. Um, this could, if there's a CME, then we have two or three days before it would hit the Earth because it travels much slower. But it could cause, uh, a geomagnetic storm will cause uh, power grids to lose their function. There'll they'll actually be sags and surges in them, and so then the... the uh, fuses get blown and you lose power. Yeah, that power. could be very damaging to any kind of electronic equipment, couldn't it? Well, and not only that, to navigation signals. Right. So you might have cases. We've had cases before where ships have run aground and airplanes have lost, you know, they've missed the runway for one reason or another. And a lot of times you can tie that back to an event that happened on the sun. You know, it just messes up all your electronic equipment. Now, we haven't you know, we we need to store our equipment, but like I said, we'll have two or three days to do that, and uh, and uh, so you need to put it into a into a Faraday box. I use a 30 gallon galvanized steel garbage right. can that and, and pad it with some non-conductive material such as a blanket or old carpet or cardboard, right? Yeah, you don't want it. To, you don't want your equipment to touch the sides of the Faraday box. Right, the sides or the bottom, any part of the metal. I did want to mention that we think that there is a, from the number of earthquakes, when I looked at the number of earthquakes that have occurred in the last week uh, from yesterday, they've gone up from 186 to 383, and that's a tremendous surge in the number of earthquakes occurring, and these are earthquakes that are uh, magnitude 2.5 and above. So uh, there's been a tremendous surge in the number of earthquakes around the world, and uh, that what happened before, before when we got the eight and the nine, the same. That's what happened: is that the number of earthquakes around the world jumped up above 400. So I'll be interested in uh, seeing tomorrow if it if it does jump above 400. In any case, I think that there's a very um, li there's a strong likelihood that we that we may be heading into a, another major earthquake. And I think that uh, it might occur along the San Andreas Fault as far north as Seattle and um, down through California or maybe along the coast of Mexico. But, of course, it occur any place around the world. It's just that we're at new moon. New moon is today. And uh, with this added up uh, earth, now new moon means that the moon and the sun are on the same side of the earth, and you do right. get tidal surges that are higher at this at this time, and there, there's and we just passed perihelion, which is when the Earth is closest to the Sun. So it wouldn't be unusual if we should uh, manage to trigger an eight or even a nine magnitude earthquake someplace really? on the Earth. Hmm. That's pretty scary. Yeah, that's pretty darn scary. And um, if it happened, they've just put out a report in uh, California that says before they had thought that 
the uh, creeping segment, and that's just east of San Francisco, was locking. And so if an earthquake occurred along the southern segment of the San Andreas Fault in Southern California, it would not affect the northern segment and vice versa. If an earthquake occurred on the northern segment of the San Andreas Fault, it wouldn't affect the southern portion. Well, they just put out a report and they said that since we analyzed um, Onda Achi's earthquake and the 9.0 that happened in Japan two years ago, April 11th, uh, we we had made the same um, theory, we had made the same hypothesis on those faults, and we were proved wrong. Right. That if if the earthquake is big enough, it will go through the creeping section. They the they've always said before that when the section is creeping, in other words, if it has small earthquakes, then uh, the stress is relieved there, and the earthquake, um, either north or south of it, won't be promulgated through that creeping part. But the creeping said, part would act like a shock absorber. Uh, is what they were thinking. Well, they were thinking that not maybe a shock absorber, but that there wouldn't be enough stress there for it to to uh, shake, to okay. break. Okay. Because uh, when they have the small earthquakes, it relieves the stress. I mean, any kind of earthquake usually relieves the stress, but of course it can <laughs> increase stress on right. other uh, on other parts of the fault. So now they're they're getting worried, and they're going to rewrite their uh, emergency planning booklets. Because before, they said, well, if it occurs in the, along the southern segment, then San Francisco can send down help. Or if it occurs during the, on the northern segment, then Los Angeles can provide right. help. Right. But if it occurs along the whole segment, then who's going to provide the help? I and, guess Nevada, New Mexico, and so forth. Yeah. Well, there, there's just not the population to do it, John. That's true. That's true. Uh, you're not going to get people to come out of there from uh, Las Vegas, and um, getting out of the Northwest is is terribly difficult. You've got the Siskiyou Mountains, and uh, I, you know, probably the easiest thing would be to come across um, Arizona or even Mexico, right. and that would be one way to get Mexican troops into California. Of course, they think it California. Be. They think California belongs to them anyway. Anyway, so that's a, I, want, I do want to put out a warning to the people living in a, in California, the whole state, that uh, I think that there is going to be a big earthquake, and certainly the San Andreas Fault might be the full. Hold that thought, and we'll be back with Alexander Bachman after the break. Everybody, stay tuned. Okay, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. This is J.R. Moore and Morrison, and we're being joined now. With Alexander Bachman on the Nutra Medical Report, we're substituting for Dr. Deagle today. Uh, welcome, Alexander. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ann. Uh, how are you today? Happy Friday. Well, thank you. Happy Friday. Uh, during the break, uh, Alex, we're talking. You know, this is uh, news to me and, and very disturbing news that the um, men and women involved in these drug cartels are having a change of heart regarding their spiritual beliefs and their religion. Uh, could you give us some details on it, if you would, please? And give us your website before you even get started. Of course. Uh, our website is alexanderbachman.com. I say Bachman, but it's Bachman if you want to spell it with a C-K. So it's right. alexanderbachman.com. Uh, well, yeah, we have information out of Mexico right now, and this is very important because it's international news. It came out uh, last week, but it's worth uh, talking upon. Uh, we have now Mexican narco-terrorists uh, leaving their faith uh, in exchange for Islam. And this is uh, something that is happening in the southern states of uh, Chiapas, for example. This is on the border between Guatemala and Belize. And uh, Islam is growing at an increasing rate very, very quickly. And it, this is under the influence of the leftist revolutionary groups. Uh, also, the student movements in Mexico, when you see them on TV, protesting on TV with these uh, scarves around their neck, you know mm -hmm. they're uh, uh, adopting Islam. So in the middle of the 90s, uh, if you don't know, on the 1st of uh, January, uh, we had a group in 1994 called the uh, Zapatistas, the E-Z-L-N, which is basically a liberation movement that is, we know it's financed by uh, the people out of France and uh, the Illuminati itself in order to take control of the huge uranium deposits up in the 
high hills of uh, Chiapas. That's not even told, which is part of the biosphere program of the UN. Right. But anyway, uh, they, what we're seeing right now is that all these movements, um, uh, revolutionary movements, as well as the narco t- terrorist movements uh, within Mexico, are now adopting Islam as a, as a new form of belief. And what we're seeing is um, a lot of Islamic activity, uh, radical Islamic activity in the southern parts of Mexico, according to a local businessman in the area uh, who does not want to mention his name, uh, he believes that um, in one decade Chiapas will be the first federal state in Mexico uh, to uh, be mostly Muslim. Uh, now, Alex, you may not know the, the answer to this question, but uh, the way Islam uh, converts people traditionally over the centuries has been under threat of death. Uh, do we know how these conversions are taking place? Are they peaceful? Yeah, we know uh, that there are Islamic missionaries walking all over the place, and they're opening up their little uh, activity centers uh, in different parts of uh, Chiapas. So they're uh, preaching the Quran, basically, and bringing people in under the guise that we are very good people, and Islam is the supposed religion of peace. Right. For, yeah. And so and if you don't convert, we'll cut your head off. Um, do we know which uh, uh, part of Islam is sponsoring this? Is it the Wahhabis or the Shiites, the Sunnis? Uh, no, not as of yet. But what we do know, for example, if we if we take history into effect, and we know in December 2011, the the U.S. authorities accused uh, Lebanese uh, businessman Ayman Juma of helping out, you know, Hezbollah with the Zeta cartel. Right. So we know, according to the DDA, DEA, that the Zetas are in fact right now operating with them. And I I do have, and we do know that they are Shiite, the ones that are working with the Zetas, for example. Okay. Okay, so the Shiite Muslims, they're building these uh, tunnels. They're helping to build massive tunnel systems between Mexico and the United States right now. Okay. Okay. And these are the same as the ones we see in Gaza and Egypt. So the expertise from um, uh, Hezbollah, Shiite, Islamo-terrorist factions are now actively working with the cartels in Mexico in the development, teaching them how to develop explosives, and what I what I fear here is uh, I have to say it Mexico is being invaded by Islam for a political and military uh, gain in this uh, third world war scenario, which eventually will uh, manifest itself. Well, I, I can easily see it going that direction, uh, Alexander. I you know I spent a year of my life in uh, in uh, U.S. Special Forces. Uh, studying classified documents on the Middle East and, and, and Islam and Middle East terrorists. And, and these people are on a mission. Uh, they're, they're very sincere about what they're doing, and they, are, they fully intend to uh, convert the planet to Islam, don't they? Yeah, they, they believe that their uh, caliphate, their fourth caliphate, which is going to be based out of Jerusalem, uh, is going to come to fruition, and that the Mahdi is coming out of the pit. You know, if we follow Reza Khalili's information out of World Net Daily and everything pointing to uh, them preparing for uh, something by March, maybe late spring, uh, with uh, the same thing on the agenda on the Western Front, well, we're going to basically be seeing this situation uh, playing out uh, this year. Uh, this, uh, the, the thing here is, like, I have so much information on these groups that they're operating on the border, they're uh, living inside apartment complexes along the border in main cities like Tijuana, Ciudad Juarez, and they live there and they're uh, doing their activities there and basically getting ready for a massive assault of the United States. Uh, And uh, that's what's going on right now on the front. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, I I know you're... Your sources in Mexico have been uh, uh, very valuable to us in the, in the past, uh, learning what's going on with the Communist Chinese, the People's Liberation Army presence in uh, Mexico. I, I find it kind of ironic that the uh, atheist Chinese communists get along so well with the uh, Islamic people. Uh, don't you find that ironic? It is ironic, you know, but, you know, it's uh, for political gain. Again, Hezbollah is not only um, uh, an armed uh, element of radical uh, beliefs, it's also uh, a political faction. And I believe that they, they come here, like we had with the situation with uh, in Mexico in the UNAM, which is a leftist university, the biggest one in Latin America, equivalent to uh, 
a Harvard University. I mean, uh, the UNAM is the biggest public university in Latin America. Uh, point being that in December 2011, uh, they, uh, the government of Iran uh, hired uh, Mexican hackers and uh, they took them to Tehran and were training them and they were trying to uh, Muslimize them, let's say, convert them to Islam. <laughs> <laughs> and what these guys did, they recorded the, the, the meetings with top-level government officials of Iran, what they wanted to do. They want to cyber-hack the United States using Mexican hackers. And Venezuela had everything to do with it. Now with uh, Chavez dead, I can come out publicly and say that Chavez was taken out by some very advanced form of electromagnetic or uh, low frequency uh, emissions to his brain. Really? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we know that he was taken out. Um, his cancer was not also uh, a cancer that just happened <clears throat> out of nowhere. So we have many world leaders uh, who get sick suddenly. Uh, we know they, they try the, the same uh, the same thing with Boris Yeltsin back in the days, you know? Right, right. Well, now they perfected the technology, apparently. But now with Chavez out of the equation, you know, things are going to be very interesting for Latin America and how uh, these uh, Muslim uh, terrorist groups are operating. Uh, I get reports from Chile right now and Peru. Uh, they're, they're telling me that uh, Islam is operating uh, heavily, you know, with the left-wing uh, people, the communists. Uh, regimes and everything that's down right. there. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of time. And Mexico is turning to the left. I mean, just in six years, we will probably see another Mexican election if we get that far, where they're going to be, um, there's going to be uh, a left-wing uh, president. Now, when was the last time there was a left-wing president there? Never. Really? Yeah. Okay. And these are the pro-gay, pro-abortion, you know, the same thing. Uh, right. Communists. Right. They're communists, atheists, and uh, they call themselves uh, socialists, but they're not. So these are well, they, people. They started in our country, they started calling them progressives. Um, they, they, the word liberal got such a bad taste in people's mouths. Yeah, same here. Same thing here, John. They they, they, they look for progress and move forward, right? Okay, so Absolutely. Yeah. we got a break coming up, but we'll be back with a new medical report in a little bit. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. This is J.R. Moore with Ann Morrison and Alexander Backman. It's easier to spell his uh, website, Alexander Backman, B A C K M A N dot com. Ann Morrison, uh, her website is Homeland Hyphen Defense, number four letter U dot com, uh, which is uh, linked on my links page. And my website is The Liberty Man, The Liberty Man dot com. Alexander, off the air, you were you were giving us some information. I think that the public needs to hear about what's going on there on the uh, eastern uh, side of uh, of Mexico. Tell us about that. Yeah, John and Ann, um, we have a situation, a nuclear situation. With the only nuclear power plant in Mexico is Laguna Verde. Now, if you want to go on Wikipedia, you can read it yourself. But Laguna Verde nuclear power plant is located exactly on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. There's an area called Alto Lucero Veracruz. And basically, it's like 250 miles south if you drive south from McAllen, Texas, along the Gulf. And um, this is one of these GE boiling water reactors. Right. Uh, it's the same one, and it has uranium inside. The same uh, blueprints as the one they, they had in, in uh, Fukushima. Yeah, and we know they are defective. So uh, this thing uh, started its operation on July 29th, 1990. Uh, but the initial Arctic, Arctic, our architects in 1975 uh, were Burns and Rowe Incorporated. Now, what we know in 1975, we have a contact from 1976 who worked in the project and said that the the, the reactors are defective from the from the moment they started building them that they exactly. are not shielded adequately. Right. There was if there were three engineers who uh, attempted to correct that, and when they couldn't get the blueprints changed, they resigned in protest, didn't they? Yeah, this is, same thing happened with the Fukushima. We have uh, an architect and a designer up in San Francisco because uh, that worked for Hitachi, and Hitachi you know, wanted to uh, cut some corners. And uh, basically because of these cutting of corners, we have these uh, terrible uh, catastrophes that, that pose a present threat to the entire region. Uh, so this reactor... Uh, is uh, presently in August of this year uh, went into shutdown. 
uh, cold shutdown. And these, uh, it's two reactors, not just one. It's two reactors. And what we're uh, worried about here is that the thing is not being turned back on. So we have right. Bernardo Salazar. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just emphasizing what you said. Go ahead. We have Bernardo Salazar. He has a Ph.D. in physics, has come out uh, in um, in Mexico and spoken out clearly on this uh, for the past two months. And he said that Laguna Verde is, a, is, a, is, is becoming a threat now. Now, I have this report at alexanderbachman.com uh, under uh, the the headlines from... Um, from December, it says risk and danger at Mexico nuclear power plant. And scientists break silence and warns nuclear threat. It's a Mexican Fukushima scenario underway. So we know that Bernardo Salazar is very worried about it. I'm about to talk to him very soon on this matter, and uh, we just ha we just got to wait and see what what happens here. Well, uh, I don't see where we got much choice. You got a man on the ground there trying to get to the bottom of this, don't you? Yeah, we have a, a correspondent from CRN, which is our network down here in Mexico, uh, who, who lives in the region and uh, is actively trying to get uh, 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 an interview or getting into contact with Salas Mar so we can get to the bottom of this. But he says that um, basically he's a very well-known mathematician and, and physicist in Mexico, Bernardo Salas Mar, I'll say the name again, um, and he's one of the biggest detractors of having that nuclear power plant turned on, you know? Well, good. Good. Well, I hope your correspondent can get to the bottom of it and report back to you so you can re report to all of us, Alexander. Yeah, they found out that the pumps did not hold, that they don't work well. Uh, and uh, he says that there's a lot of influence peddling in the contract allocation. There's a lot of corruption and very, at very corruption top Corruption and influence peddling? I'm, I'm shocked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he also said that uh, a hydrogen leak indeed occurred at the plant, and it could have generated a conflagration, uh, which it did not so, or it could have. We don't know as of yet, but he says if the pumps were to operate at 100 percent their capacity as predicted for this coming year, 2013, they would fracture uh, the, 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 the plant, and uh, this really? would create a terrible situation. Yeah. Well, obviously it would. Uh, well, uh, this is uh, no doubt a very serious situation. Um, you, would you care to make any prediction of what the outcome of this is all going to be, Alexander? Well, based on this and based on the tendency that we're seeing at Fort Calhoun and uh, uh, at Diablo Canyon Power Plant, uh, San Onofre, I think uh, all around the board these, um, these reactors are defective and they're beginning to pose a, a problem for all of us. Uh, I say shut down the plants. No more nuclear power plants, please. But when we see this tendency of democide, which is uh, governments and corporations working together, not caring about the people, and going ahead with their nuclear power programs, I believe they, they, they don't really care about us. They really don't care, and they want to create a nuclear disaster in the northern hemisphere while they evacuate to Paraguay or, some, or somewhere else, you know? Well, that's, uh, I would agree that appears to be their plan. And do you have any comments on what Alexander is talking us, telling us about? No, uh, did you did you were you going to mention about the power plants that they might be putting along the U.S. Mexican border? No, I have not said that. I, I just had a meeting last week uh, with the son of a very prominent businessman in Baja California. He was approached by American businessmen. Um, I asked if they were, came from Sempra Energy Group. He he didn't want to answer. He said, "But I'll tell you this: they came to me, and they said they wanted to buy off all my land." Now this is a big landowner, okay? And he mm -hmm. told he, he told his uh, son. Uh, uh, basically, that they wanted, to, they told him that they have a massive project to build nuclear power plants all along the Mexican U.S. border, not only in Baja California, and really? export that energy. Really, and then export it to the United States, I assume. But why would they want to do that? Because if you read up on your history, the, Rome, uh, the Club of Rome, uh, on their maps and everything that William Cooper brought out in the 90s, is basically they want to use Mexico as, uh, as a place where they can exploit and uh, dump all their toxic materials, right? right? Right. So, yeah, it's very sad, but this is happening right now out of Mexico. We have a nuclear disaster in the making, and nobody's talking about it. I mean the international media. 
Well, the lead time to build these plants would have to be five plus years if they bought the real estate today before um, they were making any electricity, and that would be really fast. Yeah, I mean, they have everything set up, but if, again, nuclear power plants are not safe at all, it's just a stupid form of generating electricity. It's really, really stupid. They're just boiling water with uh, very dangerous materials. Right, right. It would be a lot safer to uh, boil it with uh, natural gas or coal uh, and make their electricity that way, wouldn't they? Yeah, we go back to the basics. We know it doesn't harm us as much, and uh, we trust that uh, we'll be here for another 1,000 years, God willing, you know, but uh, with nuclear power and nuclear energy, it's just stupid, you know? It's just stupid, playing out stupid. And the thing we're seeing right now in Japan, uh, Fukushima, Joishi Shimatsu reporting, uh, for example, on Rents Radio uh, last, uh, last Monday, it's just terrible. It's just terrible. I mean, they, they are literally killing off the population. Now they, they are spreading the radiation by force into the food system. They're burning the radiation into the atmosphere, and uh, they're, they're just spewing out gallons and gallons of radioactive elements and into the ocean directly, into the Pacific Ocean. I believe that uh, Japan is becoming a declaration of war upon the world. I think that there should be something done at the United Nations to stop Japan from doing this this right now and have an international scope on the matter of stopping the Fukushima from uh, escalating even more. I don't know what would correct that. I'm, not, I'm no engineer in that regard. There uh, is no correction. Well, I mean, to mitigate, uh, I'm thinking maybe lots of concrete. I don't know what to do. Well, you, you could do, they should have done what they did at Chernobyl, but they did it right away. They didn't wait for two years. Right. Right. Now the damage is so bad. You have women in Tokyo with uh, 21 years old with hair falling out of their heads. You have a U.S. serviceman in the Navy bleeding out of their anuses at 21 years of age on the USS Reagan. Right? You right. have uh, the crops here in, uh, in California becoming radioactive. You have mandarins. You have pistachios. You have almonds. I mean, they're just radiating America. And the first plumes that came in on uh, March 17th, I, I got out of here because I knew this was going to happen. Um, I got out of here, followed the patterns of the jet stream, and I left with my family. But, you know, we were radiated. We were radiated. Well, Alexander, uh, we, we appreciate your being with us, and uh, thank you very much, sir. Well, God bless all of you. Thank okay, you. Okay, and you. thank you. Everybody, this is uh, J.R. Moore, Ann Morrison, and Alexander Bachman signing off for Dr. Deagle, who has the day off. All of you out there have a great, safe weekend, and God bless America.